Are you sure? Here's the 30 second lesson on what legends know. Never ask a bride why she's getting married. Don't wear a skirt on a windy day. Deodorant is not a shower. Don't sniff chili flakes. <laughs> and don't forget, saving is not investing. Legends don't just save, they invest in mutual funds. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme related documents carefully. Cut the clutter today, obviously, is on the big rollback by the Modi government of the lateral entrance scheme. As we know, Modi government had announced, they had advertised, UPSC had advertised on the government's behalf for 45 posts, 10 posts of joint secretaries, and then 35 posts of directors and deputy secretary, you know, that's the hierarchy, deputy secretary, director, and joint secretary. That has now been withdrawn. Today, Jitendra Singh, the minister in prime minister's office and also in charge of Department of Personal and Training, he wrote to UPSC saying that I am urging you to withdraw this, which means asking the UPSC to withdraw it. The reasoning he has given is a detailed one. He says that the prime minister lays great store by reservations, etc., etc. And without saying that there has been an error in not putting the element of reservations in these recruitments, he has indicated that that was the reason why this is being withdrawn for now. Of course, in his letter, you can see the copy of the letter on your screens. In his letter, he has also talked about the past, how in the past the Congress governments had recruited people laterally in high positions, how the second administrative reforms commission headed by Virappa Moili, who was a senior Congress leader, one of the top Congress leaders that had recommended lateral recruitment as well. In fact, I had also done a full walk the talk interview with Virappa Moili, in fact, on the lawns of Lawns of India Gate, of which we'll try and find a copy for you and share a link with you, where he had talked about some of these things. He had produced a multi-volume report of the Administrative Reforms Commission, which talked strongly of lateral entrance. So this letter mentions that. This letter also says that in the UPA government, there was also the NAC, National Advisory Committee, which worked with Sonia Gandhi, was a kind of a super government, right? That is something that I was very critical of in my writings as well in that period. In fact, I did call it an extra constitutional body in so many ways, an extra constitutional body that was undermining the prime minister, whether it qualifies its members qualify to be to be to be described as lateral entrance into the gov government. I don't know. But certainly this was a new structure that was set up. Now, all of this has been said. It's almost like saying you guys did it. Why are you complaining that we have done it? Now, all these things are a matter of politics of the day and we'll go into that. Also, for today's episode, be warned, there will be a little bit of or more than a little bit of opinion creeping in here and there and some some quite specifically. For example, I will I will get something off my chest right away and give you my opinion. And that opinion is that I think I think it's a terrible idea that this scheme has been withdrawn. I almost feel heartbroken that this major and administrative reforms has right now fallen by the wayside. Now it's possible that it will come back. Maybe it will come back not with 45, but maybe 145, maybe 200, bringing in the element of reservations. If that happens, that will be a good thing. And I hope, I hope it happens quickly because the problem with difficult reforms is that the more you delay them, the more difficult they become. Because with the passage of time, the degree of difficulty goes up. Modi government had thought about this very early on. If they had started in 2014 when they came to power and had kept on scaling it up, by this time maybe we would have had 500 officers of this kind brought in laterally at various levels and everybody would have got, gotten used to them and maybe in that larger recruitment reservations also would have come in because even if the government had not done it, somebody would have challenged it in a, in a court and they would have had to do it. Nevertheless, this was left too late. In fact, if we see the recruitment started in 2019 or 20, right? And then it was like nine in the first, first instance, another 30 in the next instance, 
37 were advertised in the third instance by that time some had begun to leave already i'm sharing with you an article from one of these one of the websites that covered the bureaucracy quite closely and you can see some detail there i will also share with you two stories that my colleague sanya dhingda did in 2020 one was on 29th of june 2020 which talked about modi government actually thinking of thinking of bringing in 400 people 400 people of the deputy secretary director joint secretary level sort of in quick time and that and at that point it was said that norms are being set and upsc is being prepared to do this that didn't happen that was put off for another day maybe there was a presumption that there will be a third term and that third term will also come in with a full majority maybe an even larger majority and also in a third term if a government gets a third successive term with the majority it will be that much more powerful and the opposition to the ideas of change new ideas of change would have declined to that extent but that did not happen that happens with many things that you leave for tomorrow and day after tomorrow because that tomorrow or day after tomorrow doesn't come i know the joke about that one video where i mixed mi mixed up my tomorrows so i'm conscious of that this however modi government in 2014 left for the next term in the next government they again left it for tomorrow which is the third term this time however the political equations have changed because one they don't have a majority second the opposition is very powerful now and third caste is back in the national political calculations and that is the reason i say that this reform once a reform is withdrawn it becomes very difficult to bring it back see the farm laws farm laws got withdrawn very difficult to bring back ideas like that those were radical ideas the labor courts they are still struggling to implement the labor courts the land acquisition law before that many of these laws are virtuous laws in our point of view we editorially supported these laws and yet because of the various flaws in the way they were brought in because of the lack of consultation because of the lack of parliamentary debate as with as with farm laws they were brought in as 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 an ordinance because of all of that distrust developed and those had to be withdrawn some are withdrawn some are sitting in abeyance the citizenship amendment act which we did not support editorially citizenship amendment act has taken 5 years for just a little bit of implementation now the rules have been framed just now and, and remember the last person to have come into india from these neighboring countries from these specific faiths to get the citizenship under caa should have come in before 31st of december 2014 10 years back so that's what happens it was a political idea of the bjp they they, they delayed it so much that even that has lost effect to quite an extent so that's what happens when laws are passed or I when policies are made without any consultation and without preparing the ground or public opinion and now because you are in a coalition situation taking others on board in this case as we have seen from the statements of the partners coalition partners of the bjp it looks like even the coalition partners had not been consulted or taken on board before this announcement was made however congress it was which attacked it frontally immediately rahul gandhi was in the bjp's case and said that the bjp wants to take away reservations from backward castes tribals scheduled castes and also that they were going to use this ploy to bring in their rss people rss boys into the government because this is lateral we don't know how this will happen there will be no exams etc etc and that is how this very good idea bringing lateral entrants into into the government is a very good idea and as we go along i will discuss this a little bit more with you with not with my opinion as much as with the opinion of some people who been a part of the system for some time because there is a rationale for this and there is also a history for this because india has been making lateral recruitments since the 1950s since jawaharlal nehru first took over in fact among the first to be a lateral entrant was a man called abraj kumar 
he was dual school then foreign educated but also india's first road scholar independent india's first road scholar he came back from his foreign education and entered the government straight away he served in multiple ministries as secretary particularly the petroleum ministry and was a key figure around congress government so you go that far back in 1959 after the industrial policy resolution of aicc which basically said that most of the big industry will be run by the government in india nehru government also set up an industrial management group that brought in people from outside people from the corporate sector mrs gandhi also later brought in people from outside from the corporate sector to work with her and and to take key bureaucratic civil service positions including positions of secretary so this is not that radical an idea the scale is what is different and that is what has caused this bit of this bit of controversy right now so let me first list for you the reasons i think the four reasons why this ran into such a big controversy the caste issue reservations being one but that became the larger argument to stop it but what is it that raised a lot of people's hackles one it was done on a large scale if it was 10 recruitments as was the case in 2019 20 or 30 after that maybe it would not have raised such a lot such a lot of attention even from the opposition but now with the government not having a majority 45 looked like a lot of people and with the return of caste so first was the scale second was the level at which these recruitments were being made because if we go back to the history of congress parties recruitment lateral recruitments from outside the system those were mostly at secretary level secretary additional secretary level technocrats reputed people in many cases economists vijay kelkar rakesh mohan montek singh alowalia right these were all accomplished economists dr manmohan singh before that in 1971 he became advisor to the commerce ministry so these were technocrats who were already accomplished people but they came came in at one level they did not they did not threaten such a large number of people because the larger demographic you threaten the larger the pushback that you going to have so one was the scale second was that this came at mid level so unlike unlike say any of the other people that congress government had taken in the past who came at the top levels these were 45 people at mid level so that that unsettled so many joint secretaries so many joint secretaries to be so many deputy secretary so many deputy secretaries so many directors etc and in a way it had it had it had the impact of unsettling a very well entrenched service and also public opinion third it was be done it was to be done through upsc now upsc has become an icon right now because lakhs and lakhs of people all over the country go to this really expensive coaching classes all over the country and slog and slog and slog and their parents sell their homes tractors buffaloes whatever to get their kid into into the ias or at least crack the upsc and get somewhere now for the upsc to take these people directly at a time when upsc is so much in news that became a problem so one the large scale second the level of recruitment which is the mid level third that it's being done through upsc when when the congress party got these people in as finance secretary or thereabouts they did not come through a upsc process like this and fourth these are straight hierarchical ranks right deputy secretary director joint secretary civil services are very conscious of hierarchies and also civil services have a very large network not just within themselves but families friends people who deal with them people who retired etc etc so that is why this step ruffled too many feathers first of all let me list for you many of the eminent people who brought in laterally in the past mostly by congress governments so there was for example ig patel among the first 1954 he was brought in as deputy economic advisor from the imf 
and then then became economic affairs secretary later became rbi governor as well then i told you 1959 industrial management group actually it was called the industrial management pool that came up and that brought in that brought in many eminent people mantosh sondhi for example he headed key psus i think steel psus but also after that he became secretary heavy industries in fact in my first job in a tiny magazine which used to be published from two buildings away from where i work now which is the express building in delhi magazine called democratic world mantosh sondhi's wife rita sondhi used to be a art columnist that is just an aside so mantosh sondhi he rose to be a secretary then dv kapoor dv kapoor again came in ran some public sector companies became power secretary heavy industry secretary also chemicals and petroleum secretary so these were people who came outside taken from the industry nehru did that right the socialist nehru government which had said that commanding heights of the economy shall stay with the state actually borrowed people from the private sector to to run those commanding heights for the states then then you see some more janta government 1977 79 they brought in m menezes from the railways to run to be the defense production secretary in 1977 79 you could bring in a person not from outside the government from the railways but to be the secretary defense production can you imagine how difficult it will be to do that now but maybe at that point of time we were more innocent in fact for some of these details i will also share with you a story by siddharth in the times of india who's got a lot of this very important detail rajiv gandhi subsequently got kpp nambiar who was then running kerala electronics development corporation he was the md he brought in kpp nambiar to delhi as electronics secretary government of india and after that i told you the names earlier montik singh aluwalia i told you earlier finance secretary when the reform took place and for many of these people vijay kelkar rakesh mohan besides besides being a secretary in the finance ministry he also produced that marvelous report on modernizing and reforming indian railways great mind and was also the deputy governor at reserve bank of india so these great minds were brought in and if i'm i'm overlooking anybody that's not by design it is just that a list can't be definitive otherwise it will take a long time because at various points of time smart people have been brought in from outside i'll just give you one key example how do you think india's power sector got reformed now there is an argument which many people have that once people are within the system it becomes very difficult for them to break the system because reform requires breaking of the system so can you you are in a system and you think this is too too constricted right this is too constricted this needs to be reformed for which i have to break these walls it's very difficult to break the walls when you are living inside them but when you come in from outside it might be less challenging to do that i'm not saying that it will be easier but then maybe you will be less irreverential and less hierarchical in that since the good, good example is india's power sector india's power sector was completely broken in most parts of india we had 10 hour 12 hour power shutdowns they were fires those living in mumbai or kolkata or ahmedabad would not have experienced it why because those cities have had private electrical distribution and suddenly in 5 years a new electricity act came in some other laws were passed some other regulations were made and major reforms took place so in state after state something called unbundling of electricity boards took place so electricity boards were broken up into a generation company a genco a distribution company distco and a transmission company transco each one earned their revenues users paid their bills right then then the distribution company collected those bills it gave money to the transmission company for transmitting transmitting power to it it also gave money to the generation company for generating power and if there was a shortfall then the state government was to top up that shortfall and the tariff for electricity were not to be fixed by a regulator supposedly autonomous regulator how did that reform come in 
That reform came in because Vajpayee government had the foresight. In 2002, Vajpayee government brought in a power secretary from outside, his secretary. Now, he is somebody about whom books should be written. His name was R.V. Shahi. And when he was brought in, there was a lot of controversy, the usual controversy that he had worked for the Ambani's earlier. He was before that heading DACS, Mumbai's electricity supply company. He was heading that. He was brought in as power secretary. And all of this reformist legislation and norms, all of these were set up under his watch, under an outsider power secretary. And you know what? Vajpayee lost power in 2004, in early 2004. What happened then? You would have thought that UPA will come in and among the first things they will do is to remove this power secretary who the Vajpayee government had brought in from outside. No, they did no such thing. So R.V. Shahi continued on. In fact, he is probably our longest serving power secretary ever for a full five year term almost from 2002 to 2007. By the time he was finished, the basic reform on India's electricity had been done. Then other politics comes in. Somebody says so many units free, so many units free and then and then power utilities which are owned by the state governments, they keep on going bankrupt. That's a different story. But the fundamental reform in our electricity economics was made under the watch of an outsider named R.V. Shahi and that is that is that that is a phenomenon that had bipartisan acceptance also politics was probably a little less polarized at that time or maybe more decent at that time today you would expect that if there's a change in government any government the next government will first file cases against whoever was carrying out reforms in the previous government that didn't happen in this case i'm just using this example to tell you that getting in outsiders can be a virtuous thing now, by way of some views and analysis and views and analysis from people who should know, people who are coming from within the system, two eminent IAS officers, Duvari Subarao, who finally became governor of Reserve Bank of India, has prolifically written books and articles as well. He and Gulzar Natrajan, who is an eminent IS officer of the Andhra Kader. In fact, my first visit to Vijayawada, I saw a street named after Gulzar Natrajan. So that's a rare IS officer. These two wrote an article in 2017 for the Indian Express, of which I'm sharing a copy with you. I'm sharing a link. You will also see a screenshot on your, on your screens. And the article is actually headlined, The Case for Lateral Entry. And they give three reasons to make their case for lateral entry. Number one, that the IAS system was designed for a pre-reform India of a dominant state, where the state was dominant, right? Because this was inherited from the British when the state was dominant. So this was system was designed for a pre-reform India of a dominant state after economic reforms, when state has to yield to the market. I am borrowing their language. When state has to yield to the market, and particularly, as deeper reform takes place, we need people from outside because IS people are good, but IS people see the system from within, from inside. So maybe you need people coming in who've seen the system from outside, who've seen the government system from outside, so they know, they might have an idea on what to change. That was the first reason. The second reason that Duvari Sobara and Gulzar Natrajan gave was, that IS officers or all India services officers are recruited very young. They are recruited very young. The UPSC exam system is very good, but it's prone to both flaws that statisticians list. And these two flaws that statisticians list, according to this argument, are type 1 and type 2. Type 1 and type 2 errors. What are these errors? Because while the exam is very exhaustive, very competitive and very fair, even in the best of exams, some good administrators will fail to make it and some who do make it will turn out to be not such good administrators. So that is error one and error two. So that is the second reason that if you bring in mid-career people, if you bring in mid-career people of proven abilities, then you will cover for these flaws. And the third point that make is that in all India services, there is automatic progression. 
everybody keeps on getting promoted you keep talking of meritocracy it never happens and the only punishment that an ios officer might get or all india services officer might get is a bad posting or what is called called as a sideline posting in the north it's called khode line posting or whatever but still in fact if you ask me in the best of all worlds some of these postings are to ministries which should have been more important than they are ministry of culture for example in a state a uh, ministry of animal husbandry right people are quote and quote sideline but those are vital but over time these have become positions where non favorite or non performing non meritocratic officers are sideline beyond that there is no punishment they say that's why the third point that you need these outsiders to come in to shake these entrenched officers or these entrenched bureaucracies out of their comfort zones and in their view these recruitments should have been should be between 43 to 46 years of age the recruitment system should not rely too much on qualifications but more on examinations as long as basic qualifications are there exam should be focused on analytical skills judgment maturity personality traits and they say this should be for a minimum of 10 years and these officers should be awarded state cadres they should be awarded state cadres they must be sent on field postings for about for about 5 years because the biggest strength that an ias officer has in india in the indian system is a field posting because ias officers come with field experience so these officers should also be sent on field experience and be given allocated to state cadres and they say you might think that this will cause a bulge this will cause a bulge and a and a top heaviness in the system so they say to answer that a percentage of ias officers should be made to leave the system after every 15 years so there should be an assessment after 15 years of service for every officer and the worst performing should be made to go so this is a culling after 15 years of service and that will then create space for this entrance sounds very interesting maybe too idealistic but the fact is that these ideas came from two gentlemen who actually been among our most successful and most prominent ias officers